Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Iris Ponet, and I'm uh, delighted to see so many people interested in behavioral science here. Um, I think you're in for a treat with the amazing panelists that we have. Uh, the plan for our panel is um, for the panelists to first introduce themselves, um, say a little bit about um, who they are and their organization, and then I'll ask um, a few questions, and then we'll open the floor to all of your questions. And with that, um, if I may just start on my sure. left um, with introductions. Can you guys hear me OK? OK, great. Uh, my name is Matt Sobolski. Uh, some of your faces are familiar, and a lot of you are not familiar to me. But uh, before the end of the day, I want to introduce myself to as many of you as I can. I'm really excited to be here. I am uh, the founder and chief consultant of a company called Ionia Behavioral Insights. Uh, we work mostly with healthcare. Uh, we are starting to open up a little bit into finance, uh, consumer-facing finance. And we've done some work with education. Um, we're also working with a group out of uh, Mumbai at the moment for educational auditing in India. Um, and I'm um, happy to be here, behavioral economist by training. Uh, spent a lot of time in school, like many of you, uh, interested in making a difference and doing something that matters with my life. So I started uh, my own firm, which comes with uh, plenty of uh, feelings of insecurity and instability, but it's been really rewarding so far. Um, we also have a voice language product that we're developing. Uh, to use for managing uh, patients in the home with chronic conditions uh, when they're not seeing a physician, which is about 5,000 hours in a year that they're not in a physician's office. Um, and we're also talking to a few uh, banks in New York about developing that for them also. Um, so happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, is Kimberly? Yes. Yes, perfect. Kimberly. Cool. Can you all hear me? Okay. There we go. Um, hi, I'm Kim Lucas. I am the Director of Civic Research uh, for the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics for the City of Boston. Uh, what we do uh, as a team, we're a team of 12, um, and we are basically the Mayor's R&D office. So we focus on rapid prototyping, we focus on piloting initiatives, um, and basically lend capacity to departments that want to do something different. Um, we lend thinking capacity and doing capacity, um, and uh, we are often known as the department that gets it done, the department of yes, the department that uh, actually produces things. Um, and uh, so uh, some of the uh, things that you might recognize around uh, both Boston and Cambridge that we have worked on uh, include Boston 311 um, or uh, SUFA benches, which I know that Cambridge has a, a bunch of, um, and you may have seen President Obama sitting on. Um, uh, and so we think about uh, our primary focus is on how people experience the city and what that means for them. And so how they think and feel about the city as they move through it spatially, live in it, uh, work in it, uh, play in it, um, and uh, just kind of hang out in it. So, looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Uh, Nathan? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nathan Maddox. Uh, I did a master's here at Harvard, like you guys, so I've been in your shoes. And I, I know what it's like to be a millennial uh, in the, the, on the job market. Um, so I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, started an, an initiative called the Behavioral Insights Global Initiative, um, which kind of branched out um, from uh, work I did with the United Nations on the uh, Achieving Agenda 2030 report uh, and some projects I started and so I've sort of built them out and uh, been traveling a lot and put together a number of projects um, on issues ranging from energy conservation, recycling and waste management to um, health interventions and, um, and other types of behaviors in terms of corruption and, and taxation and, and tax evasion, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and other behaviors we might want to block off or um, try to replace um, with better behaviors. Uh, so I'm really interested in behavioral change, designing interesting new behavioral interventions or nudges in addition to what we already have. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard enough about default options uh, and retirement savings. Um, I think we can do more with nudges, and so I'm looking for um, partners and researchers to help me um, take on some big problems. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert. Hi everyone, I'm Robert Reynolds. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, a few years ago, I was on the other side of this panel as a student at HKS uh, looking for jobs in behavioral science. So today I'm an associate at Ideas42, which is a behavioral innovation lab. We were started about 10 years ago as a research initiative here at Harvard. Um, a few years later, we spun out to become an independent nonprofit, and today, we have over 85 staff in Boston and New York City, DC and San Francisco, 
all working on a host of behavioral problems. And our work really centers on taking uh, insights from academic researchers like Professor Bonet and applying these to pressing problems around the world in effort to help millions of people. Um, we do this in a wide range of domains, in health, in environment, in consumer finance, uh, in charitable giving, which is the portfolio I'm currently staffed on. And we have today, I think, about 80 active projects in over 30 countries. Well, good to have you back. Uh, Nina. Hi. My name is Nina Mazar. I, I have various hats on today. So I'm an associate professor of marketing at the University of Toronto. And there I'm the co-director of BEAR, which is the Behavioral Economics and Action Research Center. We do a lot of uh, the kinds of research and activities that you guys do actually here at Harvard. I am also the co-founder of BE Works, which is one of the first behavioral economics consulting companies. We are headquartered in Toronto, although we are planning to most likely to offer um, to to open offices in, in the U.S. this coming year, most likely New York or San Francisco, or maybe both. And I was also for the last two years a behavioral, the senior behavioral scientist on the World Bank's MBET team. It was for it was first called Genie, which is basically their behavioral insights team. So we launched it two years ago, and those and there we have a bunch of projects where we are applying behavioral insights to reduce poverty. So I can answer all kinds of questions more from the non-for-profit as well as for, for the for-profit in the Western world or around the globe. So we'll see what kind of questions you later have. Fantastic. Well, thank you all um, for joining us. Um, so as I said, I'm Iris Bonet. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School. I co-chair the Behavioral Insights Group together with Max Bazer, who, who some of you um, met this morning. Um, and I direct the Women in Public Policy Program. So lots of our work focuses on using behavioral insights uh, to de-bias the workplace, um, to level the playing field for everyone independent of their demographic characteristics. And uh, just one other thing I wanted to share with you. I, um, just came back from uh, Dubai where I um, co-chair a behavioral insights um, council for the World Economic Forum um, and Ideas42 is represented, the World Bank is represented, um, uh, many, I mean, various academics are represented um, and we're basically a council advising uh, the World Economic Forums on many of the big themes that you just heard mentioned um, from poverty alleviation to health care to education. Uh, to diversity and inclusion, uh, just to say that uh, there's enormous demand um, for all of your insights out there in the world. Um, so I'm just delighted um, to see you here. So thank you for coming. Um, so then let me um, start with the first question. I mean, you've heard um, already from uh, some of the panelists about the kind of work that you're all involved in. Um, but uh, why don't you share with us um, maybe the most exciting project? And I know that's always a hard question because everything is very exciting. Um, <laughs> but still, something that is particularly exciting to you. Um, and uh, tell us a bit more about kind of how, you know how you get about, go about kind of working on the project. How did it come your way? How did you find it? Did someone call you? Did you kind of um, nudge somebody else to worry about this? And then who else was involved? And just Give us a bit of the nitty gritty of the work. And if I may, I'm just gonna okay, start with you fine. again. Thank sure. You. Um, so yes, I agree with you about everything I'm doing in behavioral insights with clients is uh, very exciting because a lot of them I, I think have these aha moments when you start describing a problem away from mechanistic solutions to why don't we look at this from like a human behavior, emotional um, solution instead. You know, like numbers are great but getting people to act is uh, sometimes even better, especially in healthcare. Um, uh, when I was finishing my dissertation, I did some research on, believe it or not, modifying uh, letter series and verbiage and using normative cues to get patients to uh, consider signing up for payment plans to avoid bankruptcy. Uh, this had a lot of benefit to them, right? They could keep their homes, keep their cars, um, which kept them arguably healthier. Um, moving into um, a professorship at a medical school, um, I recognize that um, a lot of times patients, uh, when they're not in the hospital, uh, fall back to their own devices very quickly in the home, right? So all of us are habit animals and uh, moving us away from that inertia is really difficult. You've all been reading and studying that for a while. There's nudges, there's default options, there's everything. Um, and so when I left and started out on my own, I was working on a lot of projects on chronic conditions. Um, and at the same time, Amazon was coming out with this Alexa tool. And so I have a, a colleague, a contemporary, a mentor, a senior faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, 
who is the uh, head of machine learning there, and he and I were talking about this in relation to some of the work I'd previously done. And um, I said, you know, what do you think the odds would be to start creating a voice language tool to reach patients in the home? Something that would be iterative, something that would connect them to other patients maybe that have the same disease, uh, and we could maybe develop this, deploy it, and see if um, they could get healthier uh, faster or at least stabilize themselves. Uh, he was really encouraging. Uh, I think that for all of you I'm speaking to, I, um, when you get to these projects, you get these ideas, uh, having a mentor, a contemporary, people around you that say, go for it, do it, don't be a spectator, uh, be a, an agent, work, do it, try it. Uh, he, he was all the way there with me. In fact, he got me in touch with the Amazon Fund and we talked a little bit about that as well. Um, and so we're in the process of finalizing that, testing it, um, seeing how well it works, if it fails miserably, if people take the Echo Dot or Echo Show that show up in their home and they just play music all the time and they don't take their drugs anyway. I'm hoping that's not what happens. Um, but to me, that's really exciting. It's a new technology. It's somewhat incomplete. I think we're all trying to figure out how to use voice language tools. I, um, the analogy I've heard that's best for this is sea exploration. Um, you know, there's this huge ocean around us. We're not on the land. And when we develop good tech for submarines, what did we discover? All kinds of things. Um, I feel the same way about the spoken word all around us. You know, we are familiar with um, using fields of data um, from search engines and other sources where we can just pull that data out. But being able to encode that from everything that we're speaking about in the air, imagine if uh, the beginning of 9 o'clock today until now, uh, we had all the words and all the sentences together and we were able to run all kinds of regressions and algorithms to figure out what's being spoken about, what's important, and then how to modify behavior and conversation. Doing the same thing with this uh, voice language tool and I'm droning on here, but that's very exciting to me. Um, the success we might have with it, the failure we might have with it so that we can redirect and go somewhere else, the technology that's coming out, uh, the future of that is going to be fantastic. And um, to me, as a person that is uh, passionate about behavioral insights and the good it can do for people, um, that's the most exciting thing I'm working on at the moment. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I just caught myself um, with order effects, something I'm actually very concerned about. So therefore, I'm going to go to Nina now. <laughs> Shake this up tremendously. <laughs> Yeah, so it is hard to, to, to decide which one I'm more excited about since there are so many. So I'll just tell you very briefly about one that we're currently doing with the World Bank. So there we have been approached about a financial inclusion project where it's, it's in Bangladesh and the goal is to get more women to have a savings account and be able to save for themselves and for the families. And, and what has been interesting there is I mean, there is so much research already, I would say a fairly rich body of research in behavioral finance, right? Somebody mentioned them earlier, I, I believe, the save more for tomorrow. And um, so it's, it's, it's very easy to, to quickly come up with already solutions and ideas on what kind of interventions one may want to run, but then we recently had a field trip to Bangladesh, so a few of our associates were there for, for I believe, almost two weeks and engaged in a lot of um, uh, interviews and, and round tables with women in garment factories, women um, in, in, in urban as well as rural areas, and, and after gathering a lot of information, what we realize is all our interventions were about trying to convince women or nudge women to, to, to open an account and save. And, it, and, and, and we learned, well, maybe the biggest gain may be to go through the men, because we have a society where, where, where <coughs> women still go to their men or even their fathers to ask what they think of um, opening an account, and since this is about mobile money, is also the additional issue that sometimes women don't even have their own phone. They share it, there's sometimes just one phone also in the household. So those kind of things, you know, you can ask people on the ground through a WebEx connection or Skype, all kinds of questions, but you may not realize those fine details. So really being on site for two weeks, speaking to various women, um, accompanying them through their day is a, is, is, is a really important aspect whenever we do our work. So this is basically the 
diagnostics phase. And, and so after that, we came back and, and, and had a few more brainstorming sessions with the whole team and then had some cool ideas. And uh, we are currently trying to now convince the relevant agencies on the Bangladesh side to, to try and test a few of them in the field. So it, it's still in the relative beginning, even though this is a project that has, that has been in the making for a while. So that also is one of the experiences that I've been making, dependent on in which sector we are working. Sometimes a project can take a long time until you actually have um, the green light from all constituencies to really go ahead while when we work on a project, for example, with BE Works, which is in the for-profit, which is a consulting company, their things move extremely fast. Oh, thank you very much. Um, let's go to the other side again. Kim. Uh, one project. So uh, one of my biggest projects, and some of you may already know this because you're working on a CDP with me, um, uh, is a children's savings account project uh, called Boston Saves. Uh, so the idea behind this project is to bring children's savings accounts, which is a, a mechanism toward, uh, I would argue, uh, both college and career <coughs> path making um, and culture building within the city, and also a mechanism toward financial empowerment, uh, a dual generation financial empowerment tool. Um, to the city of Boston, um, starting with a pilot of last year it was five schools, this year it's 11 schools, we're learning a lot there, um, and going out to all 72 schools um, that have kindergarten classrooms in uh, two years from now. Um, it's a really exciting project. Um, I think from my perspective, mostly uh, because it, it's a lot of mini experiments in one. We have the opportunity here for a three-year pilot, and we're in our second year of a three-year pilot right now. And um, a lot of the questions we've asked have been around program design. Um, and um, now that we are in our second year, they are more about program refinement. Um, I'll just give a little bit of uh, insight into the design piece, which was fun for us to do. I think Nina uh, mentioned this, like going into the field and hanging out with parents who were going to come into kindergarten um, when we rolled out in our first year um, and asking folks, uh, so uh, let's say we gave you money. How would you want that dispersed? What would get you to buy into this program? And, and what, where would your ears perk up and say, wait, wait, wait. Can, I, can you get me more information about that? Um, and uh, so here's one interesting tidbit about our program. We came in thinking, okay, so these programs, we're gonna need a lot of money to get folks in the door, to get folks to like say, oh, this is interesting. So we're gonna give everyone $100 of seed money in every account. So we brought that, uh, that idea to our families and a lot of our families said, wow, that's amazing, we'd love $100. And then we brought it to our families in di a different question. And they said, actually, uh, $50 would be enough. And in fact, could you use the other $50 for something else to get us to do something else? And maybe what that could be is uh, X, Y, Z. Um, that helped us really design out this program so that they're not just engaged in the beginning part of the information getting part of the program, but also in the doing parts of the program that we're asking them to do that are heavier lift. Um, and so now we've been able to leverage, as government tends to do, leverage funds that we don't, uh, that we barely have uh, to kind of make them stretch, right? Um, and all because our families informed us that we could do that, that that would make sense for them. Um, and we actually see that bearing out in our first and second year, that actually that is enough. And uh, actually for the um, kind of other things that we're asking them to do um, that are a little bit heavier, um, those other incentives play a better, a bigger role um, in uh, getting them to do those pieces of, of the process. Um, so that's fun, um, and there's tons of other fun things that we do, like thinking about uh, using leveraging technology as a means of building trust in government, um, figuring out what that looks like and how that feels, um, and all the way out to uh, working with schools, right? So schools are our other partner aside from families. Um, so thinking about that. So I like this project because it offers so many different ways of thinking um, and questioning and um, potentially answering those questions. Thank you. Robert? Uh, so uh, I'm on our charitable giving team, and all of our work is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And on the point of where do our projects come from, sometimes we do our own business development and we'll go and find organizations to run charitable giving experiments with. 
and other times the Gates Foundation will connect us to either businesses, nonprofits, um, who else, other foundations we can run experiments with. And so one of my current, pro I'll tell you a little bit about one of my projects. So let's imagine you are the charitable giver who we're trying to nudge. And let's say you graduate from Harvard and you decide you're going to become a writer. And you have a very steady income for a number of years and then you release uh, what becomes a best-selling book. And so your income skyrockets for one year. And then you talk with your tax advisor and they tell you you should give, say, like a million dollars to charity this year. This is the optimal um, amount you should give given your tax situation. And so you have basically two choices. You can give that million dollars away this year and get that tax right off now, or you can use something that's called a donor advised fund, where you send that million dollars away to this philanthropic <coughs> vehicle and you get the tax right off immediately, but you don't actually have to distribute that money to charity until sometime in the future. And so one of my current projects is with a large donor advised fund. And working with them, we've come to realize uh, that there's a lot of people who park a bunch of money in these accounts, but then take a really long time to distribute it out to charities. And once the money is put into this account, there's absolutely nothing you can do with it other than give it to charity. So people have the intention to give it away. They're just failing to follow through on these actions. And let's imagine again, you're this writer, you're busy working on another project and you just, this money might be out of sight, out of mind. Um, so we're developing a package of nudges to help people who have donor advised funds better accomplish their charitable giving goals and hopefully be more generous in the near term. So that's one project I'm really excited about. That's great. Thank you. Nathan. Yeah. Um, so I have to go last. So these are all awesome projects. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's see if I can outdo them in some way. Uh, so uh, I've been traveling like a crazy person. So I've been to like 14 countries and 20 cities in the last like five, six months, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it's pretty also pretentious. Um, so I try to make the best of it. And uh, I got an opportunity to go to Montenegro uh, with the United Nations um, to advise and give a bunch of talks to uh, local uh, country office uh, UN representatives. So that's people from the United Nations Development Program, the UNICEF, who um, I didn't really know what to expect. I've never done anything like this before. Uh, so I went, spent about a week there in a very small city called Porco Rizia, um, which, was, which was interesting, um, by yourself. Um, but the cool thing about that was I got uh, kind of pulled into all kinds of conversations that I wouldn't have gotten pulled into in a bigger city. Uh, and so there were many different representatives from many organizations in the room uh, listening to the different talks on behavioral economics or public policy or what behavioral science is. And um, um, after one of the talks, uh, the regional director of the World Health Organization uh, made a point to like meet with me. And she's like, we should just talk for like five minutes. I'm like, oh, five minutes, okay, cool. Yeah, you know how that works out, it's not five minutes. But you're like, okay, why not? Um, and so that, that turned into a really cool project on, um, uh, we're working on a, on a study in Eastern Europe uh, with uh, students who start smoking. So there they give a uh, global um, survey on youth substance use and abuse uh, for 13 to 15 year olds. Uh, and about half of students that age have tried uh, tobacco or any type of uh, substance, and 10% con consistently use tobacco. Um, so there's a lot of interesting data on the fact that students want to quit, so even young people, right, this is, this is like really young, um, 13, 15 year olds starting smoking, uh, who's, who have started smoking. Um, and so we're running a study to help um, them think about what other behaviors students might want to engage in over the weekends, instead of hanging out with their friends and smoking and drinking, because there's probably a conformity of social norms effect going on. Uh, so we're running a, an open-ended um, planning task and a meditation task in health courses on Fridays in some schools um, to get students to think about what they would like to do over the weekend by writing out a list of all the activities they would really enjoy doing, um, if they could do anything, so it's somewhat hypothetical, then also now what will you do with your weekend? And so we hope uh, in the intervention condition, so the treatment condition, that has these um, various types of um, open-ended exercises, those students will think more about um, these different activities, and then the follow-up study should show that these students have actually engaged in other activities over the weekend. So that's kind of a creative solution to think about how we can um, stop students from smoking, 
um, giving that about 80% 80, 80 of them think that others, um, so this is interesting, 80% of them think that they could stop smoking at any time, mm -hmm. yet they think in general people uh, only about, it's a, sorry, 20% of them think that it's, um, it's really unlikely that anyone could smoke. Only, sorry, I flipped that. So they really think, <laughs> ah, so many statistics. Okay, uh, they really think that, it's, that they can stop smoking, but it's really hard for everyone else to stop smoking. Uh, and yeah. so that's interesting. Uh, so that's what we're trying to kind of exploit, that finding there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, I think we're already hearing some themes emerge here from all of the speakers. Um, I mean, one uh, that you might think less about, because uh, I imagine many of you think about behavioral economics as a bit more quantitative and running experiments and doing data analysis, which is definitely, obviously, um, the core of our business in many ways. Uh, but there's a lot of qualitative work that goes into this as well. And really being in the field, I mean, all of you have alluded to that, understanding what's going on, um, what are people's concerns, and what is the best um, uh, entry point? Is it men? Is it women? You know, what leverage do we have? Um, and I, you know, then again, a second theme, of course, is uh, behavioral insights, that you do have a toolbox. I mean, as behavioral designers, as I sometimes refer to us, we do come with a particular toolbox. Um, so we're listening to what's happening. But just there are not that, you know, not that many, although, although not that few, but dozens, maybe, of um, principles that we use um, and then apply to kind of the problem that we're trying to fix. And that might be um, plan making or that might be kind of norming of people's behaviors and um, counteracting some of their um, overconfidence, for example, as we just heard now. Um, but I do think that's an important message that it uh, allows you to really get close to your clients in most all cases and work in the field and really understand an organization whether that's a chapter organization or a town or a city or a school or kids and um, better. Uh, but let me ask um, the panelists um, uh, one more question before we open uh, to the floor. Um, and that is uh, now kind of may maybe focusing a bit more on all of you. Uh, what do you look for? Um, in somebody who might be applying to a job um, at your um, respective organizations. And Kim, maybe I can start with you. Um, kind of the, what does the city um, kind of look for? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I had this question earlier, uh, which was, you know, what is the background of your team members? Uh, we have 12 people on our team. We have a mechanical engineer. We have a filmmaker. I'm trained as an ac academic. Uh, we have a former high school teacher. Um, so there's not one set of skill or background that we look for on our team. What we look for is a natural curiosity. If your first inclination when you're presented with a problem, your gut inclination is to just ask more questions about it. Um, that's one of the key things that we, we think about. Um, the other is, uh, I, I think the biggest uh, other thing uh, is really like, just an openness to other ways of thinking, right? So uh, if uh, our filmmaker and me and maybe our, our uh, you know, high school teacher were to tackle a problem, uh, we would do it uh, using tools from different toolboxes. Um, and uh, none of them are the, the way, um, but maybe all of them together create a better way. Um, and so the ability to hear your teammates, but also to hear your project partners uh, which we have many, um, uh, is kind of a, a necessity um, to be on our team. Oh, very, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Rob. Uh, so we're looking for two main things in our candidates. Uh, first, people who are mission aligned and uh, are dedicated to making the world a better place. We are a nonprofit, and so that's what we are all about. And people who have a track record of academic excellence. We do have lots of MPPs like myself. Uh, but we're open to any sort of academic background. We have people who just have bachelor's degrees, people who have master's degrees, people with PhDs, but we're, we're very open-minded. And so I, when I was at HKS, I focused on behavioral science. And that's what I learned here is probably five to 15% of what I use day-to-day -day at work. And most of what I use is uh, what I learned on the job through the training that I got at Ideas 42. And so what's most important is just a background or demonstrated academic uh, excellence. Thank you. Nathan. Okay. Um, I would say that um, I will be looking for someone who's bold, outgoing, social, and scrappy. 
so a boss, you know, uh, but also someone who understands that projects are really flexible and they're all different. And so, in terms of like many of these behavioral insights jobs, uh, some of them are part time, and some of them are full time. The full time jobs kind of hide the fact of like how many projects might get packed into that time. Um, so that's something I learned working at uh, HBS. Um, some projects could take three weeks, some could take six months, some could take four years. So knowing kind of to communicate and where to draw the line and what behavioral science it doesn't do um, are very important things. Um, so that's what I'll be looking for. Great. Thank you. Nina. Yeah, so it really depends uh, what we're not talking about. So if I think about the MBED team at, at the World Bank, so um, what, what they're what, what's really important there is, aside from the academic excellence, so I, I, I agree there, um, is that the person also has a curiosity and is willing to travel and, and, and also knows how to, how to speak to different um, entities, as in, in different, across different cultures, and, you know, a bit of a sensitivity of, 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 of how to converse with different people. I think that, that especially when it comes to the World Bank, is, is key. Um, so it's, it's important for when you are on a mission, but also within the World Bank because it's just so multinational. So I always thought that living in Toronto is one of the most uh, diverse cities on this planet. But then I came to the World Bank, and within that one headquarter, <laughs> I felt it was even more than in Toronto. So I think that that is really key. If, if, if you're not willing to travel, um, and and um, yeah, if, if if you have difficulties speaking to different kinds of entities and and, and, and also cultures, that, that that may not be the best then uh, for you, um, un unless you are more interested in quantitative work, because there, there, are, there are also pe people that are much more involved in the evaluation side of, of the project. So it's usually not the same people that go on the mission, do the survey, then think about the design and, and make sure that the implementation is done in the right way. And, and then it's a separate group of people usually that then gets that data and, and really looks at the evaluation. And, and also beforehand thinks about um, what kind of power do we really need to be able to say something in the end. So if you have for well, those kind of interests, um, we definitely also need that um, kind of talent. When it comes to BE Works, um, so at the moment we, we, we are looking primarily for graduate students that in, in addition to behavioral insights have some kind of other expertise, um, ideally with a psychology angle. Um, but that is just at the moment, but I foresee that when we are opening the offices here in the US uh, next year, that we will definitely also need people that have much more of a business school uh, background, because we will hire probably a lot on the associate level. Um, but, but, but other than that, the qualities that have been mentioned here before, I mean, the curiosity, excitement, I, I think that is, that is key because when I have an interview with you and, and, and you don't seem to be super excited, it's just for you another type of job, it would be very hard to convince us that yes, you are the person to, to get. Thank you. Matt. Yeah, so uh, three things that come to mind and going last, I guess, is I think I'm last year, um, gives me some advantages, so I'll try to keep it succinct. So um, I heard from a, uh, somebody one time um, a phrase that I really liked that sticks with me. Uh, I say this to all of you because I look in this room and I know some of you and I understand also the marquee of where we're sitting. Uh, you are all as what I would call academic heavyweights. Um, you are a force to be reckoned with in the ring, so to speak. Um, now this phrase goes like <laughs> 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 that, was <perfect. laughs> that was great. Um, so <laughs> the phrase is this, uh, success is often born out of arrogance, but greatness comes from humility. Uh, I know where you all are coming from. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you have curiosity, but along with that, you're willing to say, hey, I'm wrong here. You don't have to force your way through to be right in something. You can guide other people, especially other people who haven't had the fortunes you've had to be trained in discourse and the literature you've got to guide them towards answers that are really useful, because you know they are, but you don't have to be 
so ugly to them about or arrogant or what have you. I, I don't like that. I despise that a lot. I, I live in Alabama. Um, it's, unfortunately, it's in the news a lot lately. Uh, but there is a really strange culture there that um, can be difficult, which I don't really, really like, which is this idea of that you're not good enough because of X, Y, or Z, or that you're, um, you're lesser than me and so I have power over you. That's just silly and that's not really the American way. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is successful people or people I want to work with have three qualities. Uh, they're persistent, okay? I think all of you probably cover that here. Uh, they have a sense of insecurity, and that kind of comes with humility, but it also comes with this idea that someone's going to find you out. Like, how did I get in here, and how am I sitting with all these brilliant people? And um, you know, I'm sitting up here listening to the, all, all these other people. I'm like, man, they, got, they really have it together. Uh, you know, at the same time, you forget you're sitting with them. Um, but like, you're all sitting here with us. And the third quality is um, a sense that your life is supposed to be exceptional. Um, and you want to do something that matters and something that has substance to the world. I mean, um, you're going to be gone one day. Um, and is the world going to speak your name <coughs> at your funeral? Or are they going to still remember you when you're gone because you did something uh, for them? Um, and the last thing I'll say is about Ionia. Um, I was really fortunate, being also from Alabama and, and going to the University of Alabama, to be um, in touch frequently with E.O. Wilson, who is a Nobel Prize winning scientist. If you don't know E.O. Wilson, then I suggest trying to read some of his work. Um, and I took him to lunch one day, and he wanted to get ribs because he liked the idea of humans eating meat for whatever reason. And so we were there, and uh, we were talking about uh, one of his books that he had written called Consilience. And uh, there's a phrase in that book uh, that talks about the Ionian Revolution. The Ionians were these Greek, this Greek warrior state, and they were known for their dogged scholarly work and their persistence and their warrior nature. And I, after that talk, and if you ever sit with someone who's accomplished a lot and, and been commended and are kind of like larger than life, these, these, the words kind of are just emblazoned in your brain. And I remember driving home after dropping them off and thinking to myself, if I ever started a company one day, I'm going to name it Ionia because I, I am an Ionian. I take these ideas that are seemingly disparate and try to apply them to problems that other people don't. And I also want to be with people who are okay doing that um, and, com and uncomfortable and comfortable doing that. Um, and to me, behavioral economics and behavioral insights is exactly that. It's applying faculties of, of knowledge and information into a synthesis that um, comes out with solutions that really surprise people. Um, so those are, those are my things. I want you to be hum humble and uh, persistent and secure, a feeling of exceptionality and open to taking ideas from various places and coming up with answers. Well, thank you very much for those um Deep words of wisdom from all of you. Um, and on that note, we'll, we're opening uh, the floor. So please, um, any questions, uh, comments that you have for anyone on the panel? And we do have a mic. Yeah. Uh, there's a question right there in the back. Hi. So I'm curious. We've had uh, multiple nonprofit organizations here and throughout the day. Um, a lot of research shows that the most important work is not always the, and often is specifically not the easiest to get funded. So how is it with that, or even for profit, how do you navigate um, both providing value, and, or not even necessarily providing value, getting funded, however that is, with also doing the work that you think is most important, being the experts that others might not be quick to fund? Really anyone? Um, I'll, I'll start really quickly and get the ball rolling. It's a great question. But typically, what I find is um, as things start to grow and the ball keeps rolling, um, it's harder and harder to do what I started out doing, which is the actual work of behavioral insights and applying that to problems. There are lots of administrative things you've got to worry about. You've got to get funding. Uh, what I have found has been uh, surprising is the, the ideas and the applications that you show to you know, potential capital funding. Um, they're really open to it and very excited about it. In fact, to the point where you have to say, I need some time to consider your, your offer here before I come to you. Um, I've also had uh, some really interesting experiences uh, with people that are investors, um, trying to explain to them what it is exactly we are doing and why does it matter. But um, I think that's the really short version to answer where you're coming from is, um, it gets harder and harder and farther and farther away from me. And so getting people with me who also know that topic and can also do the work becomes even more important. 
anyone else or I mean, maybe I can add a kind of um, a thought here from a, a larger NGO and that is Harvard um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but more specifically the Kennedy School um, uh, I mean I served as the academic dean here for a number of years since I was also a bit involved in fundraising and the Kennedy School is kind of interesting as compared to some other schools um, at Harvard in that most of our donors are mission driven so they care about the topic and they want to fix a problem um, and uh, it has traditionally and I think that's probably true more generally for our community not been very easy to fundraise for behavioral insights so for tools uh, you know think econometrics or you know psychometrics or again behavioral insights it's not true that there are no funders we do have some funders who specifically think that's a really cool tool and something that we hadn't used enough um, but mostly it is people who care about health or about education you know or about poverty alleviation and then more generally about you know poverty alleviation in um, Alabama or you know education in um, in Boston um, and I think that is important um, to keep in mind um, and particularly if you want to go into kind of behavioral applications that mostly funders come through caring about the topic um, so you have to meet them there and then you have to um, hopefully um, uh, convince them that you have a tool to offer that is different from information sharing or from incentives or regulation um, that has been kind of underused and might be worth evaluating and that you also have an approach that allows funders and that often really resonates uh, to learn about how impactful it is um, whatever they're doing and I think that is another big selling point of our approach that we are all very keen on causality and understanding what works and what doesn't work and we are very keen on measuring and many donors um, can you share that um, share that of course um, other questions uh, yeah, maybe right here thank you hi um, so my question is like I work for the Inter-American Development Bank as, and I find like as in a, it's like a constant problem, like the reluctance of governments or citizens to share information. And my question is for Kim, because like I was thinking about what you were talking about, about you were leveraging on technology mm -hmm. to generate trust in governments. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know your insights on how you work with that. Thank okay, you. so um, that particular reference is about, uh, for Boston Saves, we have a technology tool where um, most children's savings account programs are created. You have one financial partner. That financial partner has technology, which then forces uh, people, families, students, whoever is using it, to use that bank and that technology. So it basically requires you, essentially as government, you're saying, if you want to participate in this program, you must go through these channels. Um, what we learned when we asked in the field, we asked folks, uh, where do you bank? What do you want? Um, how do you do this? Um, and we learned that everybody banks everywhere. Everyone is familiar or unfamiliar with different kinds of products. I have 29, what is that? I don't even have a savings account. What is that? Um, so instead of using one partner and one uh, specific technology, we went and found a technology piece that let us use lots of partners. Um, if you've ever used Mint or Venmo or PayPal, that technology exists. So let's use it for this. Let's trust people in that they know where they are, they know what they're familiar with, they know what they prefer, and we have a hope that we will help them get to that savings product that is, ex you know, that will expound and like blow out their savings, but they're not there yet and we have to meet them where they are. So by employing this and making that very concerted choice, right, we are essentially saying to people, we're not gonna tell you how to do this, but we're going to provide you the tools to help you along the way, um, which then invites lots of other questions, right? What are those tools that we now need to provide? Um, so now we're government not as a paternalistic government telling you what to do, but government as support. Um, and that, as a citizen, as a resident, doesn't that make you feel better about government? You trust us maybe a little? Um, especially if you come from a place where you would not want to trust your government, including here. 
Um, and so I think that's an important thing. And trust is built on relationships and someone has to extend the olive branch first, or the olive branch first. Um, so could that not be us? Thank you. Um, more questions? Yes, right here in the first row. And then we'll go back there. And am I neglecting the sides? No, you're good back there. You had a question? Yeah. Okay, we'll get back to you then afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. This has been really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I find, uh, as a new person interested in behavioral insights, framing the topic to non-experts is something I certainly struggle with. Um, you know, so I tell my boss I'm interested in this area, and their eyes glaze over. Um, and I don't want to just say, "Have you read Nudge?" <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Wondering how you frame this to whatever your particular audience is or, or to a broader audience about the power of behavioral economics um, to solve a wide array of topics. I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'll start this one. Uh, so I usually frame it as a, a sort of data science, data collection endeavor because um, a lot of what we do is creating data. So with surveys or whatever other met methodology you're using. You're essentially offering them free data that didn't exist before, and then you can kind of say, well, we need to now connect it, right, with whatever you had before um, to build like relational databases or get into database management, whatever they need, and it's a way to, to achieve your goals um, while still making it increasingly relevant. Um, and most companies, most people I've talked to have been really receptive to that. Great. Um, I think we have um, three more questions, and why don't we collect them? So we'll ask all three questions, and I would ask the panelists to just take notes and then choose the one that you'd like to answer. So we'll start back there. Sure. So thanks. This was great. Um, a couple of you spoke about projects in developing countries, and I guess my question is, what do you guys feel about how much this field has advanced in developing countries, and whether there's a difference in the way governments in, say, India or Latin America or Africa or process some of these interventions vis-a-vis -vis the interventions in the developed world. Thank you very much. And then we'll go back here. Thank you. And I think we have just two questions in the middle there. Um, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the validity of behavioral insights across uh, different countries, cultures, and contexts. Uh, like, w w uh, is there a boundary to a nudge in terms of its uh, scalability? Uh, if the insight that you get from one culture does not apply to the other culture, how, what are the implications of scaling for that? Thank you very much. And then we have uh, one other question just in front of you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all those amazing projects. What I I'm wondering is, as you work on those projects, how do you ensure that these are not just exciting projects? You write up a report and you move on. How do you ensure that your clients actually also implement that in the long run? Okay, thank you very much. So we have a question about low-income countries. We have a question about scalability across cultures, countries, and contexts, um, and kind of your final question about implementation. Uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, who would like to talk about the first question on the low-income countries? Who has, Nina, can I, how you, have you done, I mean, who has done work in, yeah. or? Uh, okay. Well, that's, that's it. so that's I'll say this. Go ahead. Okay, two, maybe two sentences. Uh, so it's interesting, a lot of the, the questions are about how do we protect data? But in the, the development context, it's the opposite. So that there's not data, there's nothing. So like, it's if anything, it's awesome because you can, can you can find like ways to create an intervention or collect data that's immediately relevant. Um, so I see advances becoming more and more con context specific um, in developing countries, whether it's like cash transfers or various types of financial technologies or uh, these types of things. That's my two cents. Um. Anyone else, or else um, to question two on the scalability or cross-cultural learning? And yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to say something about that. So it's, it's, that's a really big uh, challenge, and it's an important one. So I, the, the question is, is actually a, a really good one. I just wanted to give you an example of how difficult scalability can sometimes be. So we ran an experiment 
in uh, Nigeria in two different states, and you would assume you know, that the two, I mean, there are differences between those states, and we captured them, so we know what those differences are based on some surveys that the World Bank is doing on a regular basis, but again, it's, it's the same country. We did the same, we did exactly the same intervention through the exact same people on the ground, yet in one state, it worked wonderfully, the other state it didn't work at all. And we don't really know why, because we have all these other measures for the differences between the two states, and we ran a regression, we controlled for them, we looked at interactions, none of them explains that difference in the effect. And, 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 uh, and also another example, we recently ran a big tax experiment in Poland where we ran a few of the interventions that the UK Insights team did in, in, um, in the UK. And whenever you read about the UK Insights team tax experiment, it's a lot about social norms, how wonderful it worked. It didn't work at all in Poland. <laughs> and again, we, uh, we have a bunch of different um, measures to see what could it be, but we don't really have a good explanation because I can't really run a very controlled experiment <coughs> between the UK and Poland tonight to now find out what's going on. Um, but I think that's part of, of behavioral science. Um, much of it is context dependent and that, that's what we teach so often. And, and at, at the same time, I think it's important that we have those experience from the practice because then we can take it back as, as an academics, for example, and try to, to come up with, with, with ideas of how we can learn more about what are the boundaries, what are the certain contextual factors that make an effect go away or not. So, and this is where I see the very nice dialogue between the applied world and the academic world. And, um, that's what I wanted to say about that. Thank you very much. And the last question was about implementation. How do you make sure that uh, whatever our, our good ideas are, are then implemented? I can uh, touch base on this. So as I said before, all of our charitable giving work at Ideas 42 is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, part of an initiative called Giving by All. And so we're just one of many organizations who are funded through them. And all the different organizations who have received grants from the Gates Foundation are talking to each other and listening and hearing what seems to be working and with one charitable giving organization, what doesn't seem to be working elsewhere. And so when something does work, we're part of an ecosystem where there's uh, a readily available group of people who can scale this if it does make sense for them. Um, I can speak on this too. Um, with a lot of my work in healthcare um, for sustainability of effect, I evangelize this stuff ad nauseum to the workers there and the administrators there. Um, with every possible system we work with, I write weekly uh, digest about a topic in behavioral economics, uh, behavioral insights. I speak at management meetings and director meetings. We talk about the effect. We did a um, study uh, in an OR, um, and this may, the OR operating room. So for some of you in here who might think that uh, healthcare is like this uh, Halcyon of perfection or something, it's definitely not. Um, there are, were surgeons who were not doing a standard safety measure, which is a, called a timeout. Is anyone familiar with a timeout? All right, so you stop the surgery before you cut on anything and you say to everyone, do, do we have this person asleep? Have we given them antibiotics? Are we cutting off or cutting into the right place? Um, yeah. And uh, we had uh, something like 50% of these surgeons were not doing that, which, and they almost had, they almost actually put a, a false hip on the wrong hip on one patient, and so it was a big deal. So we did an intervention using behavioral insights, and I can talk to you privately about that after. Uh, we had great results, you know, up to 100%, of course. Um, and then afterwards, we stopped the intervention for 30 days, and then we measured again, and we were still at 100%. But at that time, everyone just kept talking about what, the ha what had happened and how we had made that change. And we, the things we instituted, they kept doing on their own. But I don't think that happens unless you figure out a way to evangelize it really well because you're talking about doing things a little bit differently. Um, so that's been a useful tool for me for sustaining a change. Yeah. Please join me in thanking the panelists very much. For